So you're saying trauma can unlock growth? This is America Dissected. I'm your host, Dr. Abdul Al Sayed. Make sure to like this video and hit subscribe now for more content and to support the show. Not to get downright existential with you all, but I think the central struggle of being human is the concept of agency. How much of what happens to us is in our control? How much is a function of our own doing versus divine decree or sheer dumb luck, however you choose to ascribe it? We had absolutely zero choice about the circumstances in which we came to this world, about what our genetic makeup would be, about who our parents were, about the household we grew up in. We like to take credit for our best skills, but so much of what defines us to others, how we look, how we sound, our cognitive abilities, our personality quirks, the substrate for those things were defined for us before we were ever born. But the semblance of control is so intriguing. The idea that with enough grit or resilience or willpower that we can change what is fundamental about us. And that sets up a brutal hierarchy. Those who are gifted with the things that society deems valuable, for whom it may have come easily, assume that it was their work rather than their provenance that made them smarter, richer, better looking, thinner, whatever. And rather than gratitude and better yet, an honest effort to even the playing field, they blame others for failing to work hard enough. This struggle over the bounds of our own agency is the root of so many of our deepest debates. What is fairness, free will or predestination, just to name a few. I wanted to start this episode on that note because I think it's the best way to talk about a subject that complicates these already vexing questions even more. See, the things about us that are just part of our firmament, our basic biology and genetics, if you will, those are things that we may not love, but usually come to some sort of peace with. But what about the things that happen to us, the things that we don't see coming, the stuff that shakes our fundamental sense of how the world works? That's trauma. And though we rightly try to build a world that exposes people to less of it, it still happens. And when it does, it can shake us to our core. Trauma has emerged as a central buzzword of the modern lexicon. A quick Google trend search shows that conversations about trauma really picked up in the mid 2010s, right around 2016. I have my thoughts. But as the word has emerged, it's also taken on expanded meaning. Where trauma had been rather tightly defined by experts in the DSM-3, which came out in 1980, to mean, quote, an event that is markedly distressing to almost anyone and involves a serious threat to life, the term has grown to encompass much more. The most recent DSM, which came out in 2013, DSM-5, defines trauma as, quote, a physical or emotional response to one or more life-threatening or physically harmful circumstances or events. But our modern vernacular has expanded trauma even further, and the word has gained power, largely because of its best-known consequence, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is a well-described mental health disorder that occurs among some folks who are exposed to trauma. Its symptoms can include flashbacks, hyperarousal to certain stimuli, hyperreactivity, avoidance of potentially arousing stimuli that can trigger responses, and depression, anxiety, and difficulty sleeping. It's debilitating to those who experience it. But as awful as PTSD is, it's not the only response to trauma. While trauma is always bad, it turns out that our response to it isn't uniform. In fact, some folks who experience trauma actually grow through the experience. Back in 2020, I was preparing to give a talk. This, of course, was the dreadful first year of the pandemic, a complex collective trauma. So I wanted to leave my listeners with something, anything at all, that could empower us through the experience. And that's when I came across Professor Richard Tedeschi's pioneering work on post-traumatic growth. It's the notion that after a traumatic experience that shatters our sense of the world and our place in it, Wading through the disorder that arises can actually lead us to a more grounded, balanced perspective on the world. While it might violate everything we've ever heard about trauma, if you think about it, it's not as improbable as it may seem. So much of what we talk about when we think of, quote, resilience or anti-fragility or grit is the ability to metabolize adversity, the ability to make sense of that space between what is, in fact, in our control and what's not, the limit of our agency. I knew then that I really wanted to have him on the show to share more about what post-traumatic growth is, how it happens, and how we can cultivate the mindset of growth, hopefully without the trauma. But if we must, then in the face of it. Here's my conversation with Professor Richard Tedeschi. Introduce yourself with the tape. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Richard Tedeschi. I'm executive director of the Boulder Crest Institute for Post-Traumatic Growth. I know that you, you come from a line of veterans. Um, what did your experience with loved ones who'd experienced trauma uh, teach you about about what trauma is and, and how it operates in a life? Well, um, my father was a Marine Corps veteran, but he died when I was in high school. So mm -hmm. I can't say that I learned a lot because he never really talked about his experience at all. Um, he was a World War II veteran. Um, 
served on a number of amphibious landings in the Pacific, uh, Purple Heart, um, but I never remember him saying anything about the war. Um, mm. So I didn't really learn anything f uh, about that. Um, and then I remember after years after he died, I was helping my long uncle clean out his house, and uh, he had a uh, he had a bunch of letters that my father had written to him during World War II. And he asked me, "Do I do you want these letters?" I said, "Sure." Um, yeah. And um, so I have some letters he wrote, and then um, uh, a fellow I know, a uh, military man I know, um, asked me one time uh, if I had my father's records, and I said no. He told me how to get his records, so I got those. And in those records, uh, it was clear, um, and uh, from my uncle's report to me, it was clear that my father had PTSD. Um, mm. I think that uh, that probably had something to do with the fact that he didn't want to talk about his years of service. So um, I was kind of informed that way uh, about my father's experience, but not directly through him. Hmm. And, you know, in some respect, that's its own kind of information, right? It's a, you, you can almost read as much into what people don't say sometimes as, as what they do say. Um, I'm sorry yes. to hear about, about his experience. Yes, I think that's right. And, um, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's sort of um, ironic, I suppose, or something that I uh, ended up studying all this stuff, uh, not having really known when I was a kid what my, um, you know, what my father had really gone through or what his uh, struggles might have been. Hmm. It's like it was right there with you, but you never had access to it almost. Correct. Right. Hmm. And, and tell me a little bit about your path to psychology, why you chose to become a psychologist. Well, uh, I guess it's not that complicated. I think I chose to become a psychologist because I, uh, I learned when I was growing up with my friends that I liked to uh, help and I liked to listen. And that's a lot of what I ended up doing was helping and listening. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was fortunate enough when I went to college, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, but I had an idea about that, but I never read any psychology or didn't have any coursework or anything in high school and all that. But when I went to college, the professors there, the faculty who were te teaching those courses were very good and really interesting and um, piqued my interest. And then as I got further through college, um, some of them were very uh, helpful in giving me opportunities to do research and um, and as an undergraduate, I actually take graduate courses. Um, so they were very uh, generous with me. And uh, so they really um, uh, provided me with, the, with these kinds of opportunities. And, and I am grateful to, for that. Yeah. I want to ask, you, you've, you've become an international expert uh, on, a, on a word that I think has become <clears throat> very much a part of the zeitgeist. And I can say that, you know, even in my adult life, it's a, it's a word that we hear a lot more about you know, even since I was uh, a bit younger, and that's trauma. Um, I, I want to ask you first, what is your definition of trauma, the, the, the definition that, that, that's operative in your mind? And then what do you think has led it to become so much more a part of our common vernacular? The, the definition of trauma that, um, that I tend to focus on is one that's, that came out of the work of... Um, Ronnie Janoff Bullman for, for one. Uh, and that is the idea that what's really traumatic for people is when their core belief system or assumptive world is challenged or shattered so that people f hmm. fail to really understand anymore what it is that's going on in their lives and what's happening around them. And, and, and things become very confusing and anxiety arousing. So their core beliefs about such basic and foundational ideas and conceptions like um, how predictable life is and how controllable events are, how benevolent the world is, uh, their own value, um, their, their moral code, all those things start to become questioned and that's highly anxiety arousing and 
and creates a lot of chaos. Um, so it's not so much a particular kind of event. Um, it's the, the impact on people's thinking processes and, and that creates a lot of emotional turmoil. Uh, and that's, that's the key to what makes things traumatic. And so, um, it's a different sort of way of thinking about it rather than focus on the event itself. You focus on what kind of impact it's had on the person. So mm -hmm. events are potentially traumatic, but then we see what happens when they actually have their effects. And as far as, you know, why this has become so commonplace concern in the sort of general public, I guess we could say, um, I think um, it's it's a recognition that there are so many people that are struggling with circumstances in life that uh, that have these kinds of impacts, uh, and we're starting to recognize that um, this these kinds of struggles are more commonplace than we than we've often thought, and and trauma has then proceeded into to thinking about all kinds of different events, but I can I can also say that it's probably in some ways overused, and people apply it to things that really uh, aren't traumas in the way that I'm talking about it. Just like you know, so like we overuse the word depression. Like people say they're depressed, and you know that's really not so true. You know, maybe they're unhappy about something or have a down day or something. They say they're depressed, but that's a different use of the term than we think clinically. Probably mm. the same for trauma. A lot of people might say something was traumatizing and, and the way that I'm talking about it here is, is different from how it's sometimes used in that sort of general vernacular, like you say. You know, there are a couple of pieces to the definition that I think are really important to tease out. One, as you mentioned, is that the, the definition you're you're using is really about one's psychological response to a stimulus rather than the nature of the stimulus itself, which implies that two people can experience the same exact thing and have a very different uh, internal response to it. And I want to uh, sort of put a pin in that because we'll get to it. I think it's quite critical to, to, to be thinking about. Another is that, you know, there is something about that, um, the, the the level to which it is uh, internally disorganizing, um, and, uh, and, and, in the way that it shakes one's, um, as you, as you, you talked about, uh, internal belief system about what the world is that really, it matters here. And I think, you know, to your point about the use of it, right. When we start to define, um, noxious stimuli that still fit within our, our understanding of the world as trauma, it starts to shake that sort of sense of like, what is actually trauma? And, um, and I, I want to dig a little bit more into that. To begin with, I mean, just as as we as we continue to explore this idea, how common do we understand trauma to be in the general population? Well, I think it's hard to get through life without something that is um, going to challenge um, your beliefs about things at some point or another. But the degree to which that challenge um, creates this kind of chaos I'm talking about varies a lot. So there are all kinds of like I said before, potentially traumatic events. And then we get to ask, you know, how do some people um, navigate those things quite successfully and they figure them out and, and other people um, are stopped dead in their tracks and really have to struggle to um, make sense of their world and go on with their lives, maybe in a new path. So um, there are plenty of events that are potentially traumatic, but it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen with a, an individual. You know, I, I remember with a psychotherapy client of mine who was dying of cancer and, um, and I made a stupid assumption, I suppose, but not an unusual one. I think that, you know, dying of cancer might be the hardest thing that you'd have to go through. Um, and he said, actually, no, this isn't, this isn't the hardest thing. Um, my divorce was a lot harder than this cancer. And I said, well, mm. tell me, ex explain how that is. And he said, well, you know, I always figured I was going to die. We all die. So this isn't surprising that I'm going to die. 
Um, this just mm -hmm. happens to be the particular way that is, that's going to happen for me. Now, my divorce was a shock. I never thought that I'd lose my family and I'd go through something like that. That really was a shock. I never anticipated that. I didn't think I was going to have, have that la happen in my life. Dying, yeah, that makes sense. The divorce didn't. So there you yeah. have it. You know, it's it, you can't tell. Uh, you have to be inside the other person's life in a way to really understand what what trauma is for a person. That's really illuminating, and I really appreciate that uh, that example because it does capture this sort of idea of whether or not that um, external stimulus is in violation of what you expected to happen, right? And how, what your narrative of the world is and whether or not something like this could potentially be ex be included. Um, I, I, I want to ask, right, because to talk about post-traumatic growth, you almost have to do it in um, contraposition to the thing we usually talk about when we talk about trauma, which is post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder. And you, you talked about it with respect to your father's experience after World War II, um, what is post-traumatic stress, stress disorder and how do, we, how do we think about it? How does it arise? Well, post-traumatic stress disorder is, is defined by a number of criteria that you, that you meet if you're diagnosed with that. So there has to be a, there has to be a certain kind of, now, now we're going to talk about the diagnostic criteria for it, which I have some trouble with to tell you the truth, hmm. but I'd love to hear about um, it. Well, the, tr the trouble for one thing is, you know, you have to have you have to meet a criterion for uh, having a traumatic stress, and which is defined as uh, witnessing or experiencing that's something that's life threatening. And like I just said mm -hmm. about that guy's divorce, you know, sometimes traumas aren't life threatening in that sense. But you know, in the diagnostic manual, you got that kind of thing. And then you mm -hmm. have um, intrusive thoughts. You have uh, negative alterations of mood that are negative. So people are depressed and anxious. Um, they have negative thoughts about themselves and the world. Uh, they are they are more reactive to stimuli. So they have a, a startle response. Um, they have intrusions. So they have thoughts that they can't stop or nightmares and things like that. They're out of control of and they're thinking and. So these are the different criteria that define post-traumatic stress disorder. And so um, it's, you know, it's, it's something that's not, um, not produced by situations that are different from post-traumatic growth. I mean, this is where they, they, these things arise out of the same fertile ground, I guess we could say. All those negative experiences that I just mentioned come out of um, come out of events that um, are shocking to people, and the way I'm talking about it is they're they're shocking in terms of making it hard to predict and control and understand um, uh, the world as it is. and And you mentioned a moment ago, Abdul, you mentioned uh, the narrative. That people have and that's another way of thinking about it is the life narrative is disrupted you know people think that life is going to go on a certain way and then suddenly it takes a turn for the worse it's like i can't believe this happened to me um mm -hmm. so there's that that disruption in a life narrative so uh traumas that um that are the beginnings of post-traumatic growth are often the beginnings of post-traumatic stress disorder as well like it all comes from the same kind of experience, the same place. Which forces the question, tell us a bit more about post-traumatic growth, which has really been uh, your life's work. Because we, we hear a lot about post-traumatic stress. We, we don't hear as much about post-traumatic growth. And, and what you've demonstrated is that's actually more common. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what it is and, and how it operates? Yeah. Um, post-traumatic growth is the, uh, the, the positive uh, outcomes or experiences people have as a result of their struggle with traumatic events. Events, like I mentioned, that shatter the assumptive world or the core belief system. So people struggle with that, try to make sense of it all, and reconstruct some way to understand themselves, their lives, their future, the world. And in that reconstruction of all that, they sometimes, often, uh, come to understand 
things in a new way, better way, um, make sense of things in ways that they hadn't really considered before, and maybe live in ways that they wouldn't have done before. So this whole process of reconstruction of the core belief system um, can yield some um, good outcomes that people really value. And a, a metaphor that my colleague Lawrence Calhoun and I, when we developed this concept um, that we, we started using f from the, the start was a metaphor of an earthquake. So the core belief disruption is like a psychological earthquake. And what earthquakes do to a city is they bring down the infrastructure. So we have a psychological infrastructure too. And just like a city's water system, electric grid, buildings, roads, all that stuff gets shattered in an earthquake, our psychological infrastructure is shattered too. And we got to rebuild it. Uh, the city's got to rebuild. And in rebuilding, um, hopefully they rebuild something that's um, a better version of the city, something that's mm. stronger, more resilient. So resilience comes out of the, the rebuilding or reconstruction experience. But more than that, wisdom. Psychologically, we become wiser about life and how to live it and the best things for us to be doing uh, in, our, in our lives. So that reconstruction process results in this, these growth outcomes. As, as I was preparing for our conversation today, and, and I've been a big fan of your work ever since I first came uh, upon it, and I was trying to really think through what the mechanism of this would, would be. And I, I can imagine it has a lot to do with, with this idea of, of locus of control, of, of who has control over my life. And I can imagine the challenge of a stress or a, a trauma is that it violates what you think was going to happen and it fundamentally robs you of a certain amount of control. But in some respects, if you think about like the way your life is going and the story you tell yourself about your life, in some respects, there's like momentum there. And anybody knows who's ever been in a car that's rolling, you don't, you're not really controlling it. It's just kind of rolling forward. And then you have this stress, which violates what you thought was going to happen, which really robs you of your control. And then what happens next, if you're able to, you know, as you said, kind of rebuild your internal infrastructure, your city, you prove to yourself that you, you, you can actually change the course of your life. And I can imagine that that's an extremely empowering experience as opposed to that stress that took everything, that, that, that changed what you thought was going to happen, that robbed you of something that you, you thought was, um, was, was coming in your future. And I, 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 I think, you know, if, if you've sort of come through a trauma like this and you've proven to yourself that you can rebuild, you become then more fortified against the next one because you're just saying, well, if that happens again, I'll just rebuild again, right? Because, because I can do that thing. And I, I'm wondering, you know, how that shows up in, in the choices that people make around, um, you know, what they do in their life, either related to the trauma that happened or, or maybe independent of the trauma that happened around the decisions that they make, the risks that they take, the, uh, the willingness to sort of exert a level of, um, of, of agency in their lives. Well, I think what starts to happen is that people st start to think differently about some of these concepts and terms that they thought they knew. So, for example, you're talking about control. And um, very often af after traumatic events, uh, people um, may start to think about control in a different way, define it differently, um, have a different understanding of what control means. Um, so the meaning of things often starts to change for people. Um, hmm. You know, having control over my life, what, do, what does that actually mean? And sometimes there's a paradox that people start to recognize about such things where um, they feel more in control by giving up the attempt to control everything. Um, so the, the understandings of living life well or living life in a fulfilling fashion can start to change because people have a change in this, this perspective. Um, so one of the, I mean, the major paradox of PTG, post-traumatic growth, is out of loss comes gain. I mean, you know, loss sounds like a horrible thing and who wants to lose? But, you know, another part of loss is grief. Um, 
So people grieve, but then sometimes they find out that in their grieving, they become more grateful for what they still might have, even though they've lost something mm. of great value or relationship or person, um, that they become more grateful because of the grief. So another kind of paradox. So there's all these sorts of paradoxes that people have. And, you know, the, the one of, uh, you know, feeling more in control when you're, you're less intent on exerting control is another one. Um, and, um, and that, and that shows up in a lot of places in life that start to become clearer and they, they might not have considered before. Um, so, mm. um, you know, a, a lot of times where we try to make things happen a certain way, we're working against ourselves and we have to relax and let things happen. Um, and then it's better. Um, sex is a good example of that. If you try to make sex happen and, you know, it doesn't work very well, but you have to relax and mm. let it be and, and be enjoying it. And then it's okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's all sorts of examples of this in life. Uh, a lot of um, athletic um, uh, examples too, you know, where people uh, try too hard and then their performance um, suffers for it. Um, and, um, you know, all sorts of ways that we make ourselves anxious about things because we're trying too hard or trying to control something. And then it doesn't go very well because our anxiety is too high. Um, we try to control relationships with other people because we want them so badly. And in the process, we annoy the heck out of them and they don't want to be with us and they leave us. So there's mm -hmm. another one of these paradoxes that we have to learn about. So, so you see, there's all this all this learning that can start to happen in the aftermath of trauma because we're forced to reconsider how we've been doing things and what, you know, how we're going to do it in the future. So there's, yeah. there's an opportunity there for us. I appreciate that. And I think what you're highlighting here is a lot about the, 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 the balance, the dance of life where you kind of have to find the music. And, um, and this reminds you that, uh, that, that, that dance, that, that need to let the music control the rhythm and, and, and you move with it, uh, maybe to torture the metaphor here, um, becomes an insight that people gain. America Dissected is brought to you by Marguerite Casey Foundation. Are you ready to break free from the confines of traditional book clubs? Introducing Reading for a Liberated Future, the Marguerite Casey Foundation Book Club, where bold ideas, new visions, and daring experiments converge. Say goodbye to the same old narratives and hello to a vibrant, beloved community pushing boundaries and challenging norms to create a better world for everyday people. Each month, the MCF Book Club will bring you an insightful conversation with luminaries of our time who are speaking truth to power in doing the hard work of shaping a liberated future. Register for the Marguerite Casey Foundation Book Club today to get the latest information about our upcoming events and a chance to have one of their book club featured titles sent directly to your door for free while supplies last. Join the MCF Book Club at caseygrants.org slash book club. That's C-A-S-E-Y-G-R-A-N-T-S dot org slash book club. I, I want to ask you because... Um, we hear a lot, like I said, about post-traumatic stress disorder. We don't hear as much about post-traumatic growth, and it's such an empowering concept. Why do you feel like when we think about trauma, we're less focused on the potential positives um, and the opportunity in it and more focused on the loss and the negative of it? Well, I think it's because trauma, when it's first experienced, is, is miserable and scary, and that attracts yeah. our attention. So it's per perfectly natural. Um, these are events that people don't want to go through. I wouldn't recommend them to anybody. You know, some people have, have misunderstood post-traumatic growth because they think that I might be suggesting that trauma is a good thing, and that's certainly not the case. Mm. Nobody wants it. Um, but, um, but it attracts our attention because it is so horrific. Um, these things are so sad and are frightening. And so, of course, we're going to get um, our attention pulled in that direction. Uh, and then the other part of it, of course, is uh, when things are that bad, they're not easily healed. They're not easily managed. Um, it's really difficult. Um, so, so of course, we're going to pay attention to something like that that is a problem that's hard to solve. Um, so yeah. we're going to pay attention to that. 
uh, it, it's, it, 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 it creates chaos in our lives. You know, we don't like that. So of course we're going to pay attention. So that's all well and good. And of course, as, as professionals who are uh, treating people with trauma, we're going to pay attention to their, their misery and their heartache and their suffering. Uh, and we want to relieve it. So we're going to be focused on trauma and relieving all that experience and that those symptoms and all of that stuff. So that's natural, of course, as well. All of that's natural. But um, strangely enough, the um, you know the the common experience that we have in the aftermath of so much trauma, and we if we pay attention to people's stories, if we if we look over a long enough period of time, we also see these these growth outcomes too, but we just, you know, we have to stay with it long enough to see that part of the story. I appreciate that. I I think I want to ask a question that I I imagine all the listeners are probably asking right now, which is, are there predictors of who's most likely to experience post-traumatic stress versus post-traumatic growth? And, you know, we hear a lot about these concepts of anti-fragility or resilience. And is there something that, you know, listeners can do to start um, building that in themselves or, building the capacity to achieve growth should something uh, or the worst happen? Well, here's one thing that is important to understand, and that is the post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic growth are not opposites. Again, they come from, they come from the same experience. So you, you, people experience these things together. They're stressed, mm. they're miserable, they're suffering, and they're in a process of growth at the same time. Uh, in the early stages of this, it looks like just the suffering and the misery. But if you track mm. this long enough, you start to see it shift uh, so that people can notice some kinds of changes that they value. So that's that's something I want to mention. Now, what are the predictors of this and what can people do? One of the most important things that people can do is to find an expert companion through this process. Mm. So um, instead of emphasizing so much um, that certain kind of people uh, are more likely to experience post-traumatic growth, I like to emphasize the kinds of circumstances that can help people move towards post-traumatic growth. And those circumstances are interpersonal. Um, Having what um, we have called, and I say we, like, referring to the people that I work with, not just that I'm king or something. Um, uh, You know, what we call expert companionship is really important. Um, And that means a person or persons who are willing to hear your story and notice what's valuable in your experience and in you, encourage you to be open about that experience, help you find ways to regulate your emotions that are making that experience so difficult, and to um, see a, a story going forward in your life that carries possibility and makes use of your capabilities and strengths and maybe what you're learning in this process. A person who can be with you um, through all of that, a companion with you through all that is very useful. Not a person who gives you a lot of advice or tells you what to do or thinks that they have a formula uh, or thinks they know you better than you know yourself, but a person who is joining with you in going through this link, perhaps lengthy process and is someone who holds out hope for you and um, and appreciates you and and appreciates how hard the process is that kind of expert at companionship the expert at being that sort of person who you can count on in these times that's that's a crucial part of the post traumatic growth process that interpersonal part i i really appreciate that um and I find it really quite sad because we're living, of course, in times where people have fewer and fewer of those kinds of interpersonal relationships to go to. And I, 
you know, if if um, folks can can uh, or have the the ability um, to you know identify a therapist and somebody who can who can do that for them formally, that's great. But so often we turn to a loved ones, um, and they may not be the closest loved ones who might experience it with you. But you know, you can imagine an aunt or an uncle, a cousin, a, a good friend, um, and those relationships are getting fewer and further between. And I, I want to ask, you know, how impactful has that been on our ability to process trauma? I, f- I feel like part of what's coming out of this conversation is that so much of the reason we focus on trauma not, is not just because we live in traumatic times and also are exposed to so much information that generations past didn't get in the, the rawest form, but also because that those same m- methods that are giving us constant exposure to what's traumatizing in the world are also taking us away from each other. And I, you know, want to ask you, as you think about, you know, your career, you've practiced for some time, how have trends in the ability to unlock post-traumatic growth changed with these changing means of conversations, the changing units uh, in which we engage? Well, um, I talked about paradox before, and I guess maybe this is another one. I think what you're saying is that we're more disconnected than we ever have been. Um, But of course, there are ways that we're more connected than we ever have been, too. Um, yeah. so this, just what we're doing here now, like Abdullah, I'm, I'm not even sure where you are in the world right now, <laughs> but we're not in the same room and we're having this conversation. We know that. Um, so we have this connection that we couldn't have had, you know, decades ago. Uh, so we've got those kinds of possibilities, connecting with people in all sorts of places and learning from each other and have, having those, those kinds of companionships. Uh, that wouldn't have been possible before. Um, So there's that. But then, of course, um, given that we've become so dependent and reliant on these electronic means and we kind of hunker down um, looking at our phones in in every place that we go rather than looking at other people or talking to them um, creates this disconnection. So, you know, it's kind of a paradox um, there's good and bad in the developments this way. Uh, so I guess, you know, we have to sometimes relearn how to be personally connected. Um, mm. And, and um, it's, um, it's kind of an unfortunate thing that sometimes traumas are what force that relearning. Um, yeah. But, but that's part of post-traumatic growth too. I, you know, one of the, there's these different elements of post-traumatic growth that we've talked about. And one of them is strengthening of your relationships where you feel more connected, um, more empathic, more con- compassionate, um, perhaps because you've experienced expert companionship because someone's come into your aid or because you've had to find some people to be connected to. Um, yeah. So, So there's that part of it too. You know, it's hard to talk about trauma without talking about this collective mass trauma we've all come through, which is this pandemic that uprooted a lot of people's lives. Can you tell us about how um, this sort of unique, um, mutually shared experience has, uh, has you know, changed our, our, our perspective on what's possible, and what the impact has been um, in terms of uh, all going through this at the same time? Has that allowed us to sort of have this expert companionship because we all kind of knew what it was like? Uh, or has it been uh, more of a challenge because all of us were, were dealing with our own challenges coming out of the pandemic? Both. Again, it, it mm. always seems to be both. You know, um, the pandemic isolated us from one another uh, as we were afraid to have social contact, right? We need to do social distancing. Remember all that? social distancing, right. keep your, keep your distance. I mean, that's really unfortunate. That's really very, um, you know, that, that just plays havoc with the social fabric and our interpersonal relationships and our ability to, um, make new connections with people and all that scary stuff. So that was unfortunate. Um, but of course it created more of what we're doing here. We're, we're, social distancing, but we're connecting this way. Um, So people started to do more of this. You know, I I never thought as a psychotherapist, I would ever do virtual therapy and video therapy and stuff like that. Before the pandemic, I didn't do any, zero, never did. 
And I thought that was, mm -hmm. you know, that's not a very good way to do this. But of course, in the pandemic, I had to switch over to doing that entirely. And I did. And now yeah. most of my practice is video. And, you know, now I'm licensed in all kinds of different states. And I see people across the country that I never would have mm -hmm. talked to otherwise. So it's worked out positively in some ways that I can work with people that I would not have been able to work with before. I really appreciate this this rhythm. You, you have this push-pull rhythm, which is you know both and, right? It's like, yeah, there are challenges yeah. and then there are also opportunities. And if you identify the opportunities, you can identify the point of growth. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a practice you've really developed. And I, I, I see it in the way that you answer questions, which I appreciate. Yeah, you know, Abdul, uh, uh, you know, going back to your question about who's going to experience post-traumatic growth, I think one of the things that people need to cultivate is dialectical thinking, like we're talking about right now, that push-pull, mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, th thinking dialectically means recognizing the flip sides to things and that both those things are true at the same time. Um, and, that's a, and that's a way of thinking that um, allows people to consider the possibilities that otherwise would be hidden from them. You know, it's 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 like there's no catastrophe. There's no true catastrophe, nor nor true um, euphoria. There's experience, and one finds the the catastrophic and the euphoric. It's, you know, I have a six year old, and um, you know, the, as she deals with the vicissitudes of her life, and you'll try and point her to, hey, the, here's this other opportunity that came out of this thing that you were all upset about, and she'll look at it and say, but I wanted the other one. And, um, I think so much of our experience of that is I wanted the other one and it's a, it's a unique thing. And we understand as, you know, as, as adults that we can't really go back and get the other one, but, but that ability to sort of let go of what you wanted in the other one to find what you can want in, in, in this one, um, I, I think is so much of, of what you're, um, really pointing us to here, which I appreciate. I want to ask one more question, um, because you've, you've, um, really done a lot of work around, um, uh, around the well-being of, um, of of veterans, and uh, your your foundation, Boulder Crest Foundation, um, is really focused on providing um, a, a level of service to folks uh, who, for a lot of reasons, um, have challenges uh, obtaining that. Can you talk a little bit about that work um, and why it's so important to you? I very much appreciate you bringing that up um, because at Boulder Crest um, we are. Uh, we're programming based on this post-traumatic growth concept and our programs are for uh, veterans uh, and first responders like uh, firefighters, uh, law enforcement officers, uh, EMTs, um, all sorts of people on the front lines of serving their communities. And um, these are people that because of their professions are faced with traumatic events uh, as part of their work. If you're, you know, you're a military person or your first responder, that's part of the deal. Um, but um, they're all human beings and these things can really take a toll. So um, in our work at Boulder Crest, um, we have very innovative programs um, that help people see the possibilities for growth in these experiences. And one of the one of the things that we do that is that is so important is we emphasize this expert companionship that I'm talking about by by having all our programs be peer driven. So they're peer to peer programs. So, you know, I help develop them. I help um, do the research on evaluating them and do training and all that. But I, I don't deliver any of the programs. Those are all delivered by veterans themselves, first responders themselves. Um, we help people learn how to help their uh, fellow first responders and veterans because they're the people that, that get it. They, they know it. They've lived it. They've been there. And they're the ones that are going to be best able to connect, form those kinds of connections and, and foster post-traumatic growth in these ways. So, um, and the other thing about uh, Boulder Crest, I think is so important is that all our, uh, our, programs are free. So um, the founder of our of Boulder Crest, uh, Ken Falk, who's a Navy veteran, uh, has done an amazing job of, of getting 
funding for the, for our work and building uh, this this network of places people can go to um, to experience these programs. So uh, so they're free, and um, and then all our first responder work is um, is done in a um, fashion where we go to the police departments or the fire departments or uh, the emergency medical departments and uh, help them figure out how to get grants or funding or whatnot so that all their employees can benefit from all of this. So mm. we try to make it very democratic, um, available, accessible uh, to all these people who really need this. So it's been a very uh, fulfilling uh, place to work for the past 10 years. Uh, and, um, and, you know, it's, it's amazing what's uh, going to be happening in the future. Uh, it's, it's remarkable how um, just by word of mouth, um, this takes off. So for example, in our, our first responder programs, you know, we haven't, we don't advertise anything. We don't try to get anyone. It's, one police department tells another police department that kind of thing, and it goes across the country. All these people talk to one another, and that's how it happens. That's uh, that's really amazing. We'll we'll make sure to um to include a, a a link so folks can can learn more about it in the show notes. Um, our guest today uh, is Dr. Richard Tedeschi. He is a, a psychoanalyst and um and uh, the the psychologist who's who's brought us uh, this concept and, and formalized the concept of post traumatic growth. I really uh, appreciate um, you sharing the work that you and your colleagues have done on this uh, and joining us today to, um, to share some more of, of your experience and your insight. Thank you so much. Abdul, I really appreciate the conversation with you and the kinds of questions you asked that led us to dig into this a little bit. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you for your opportunity. That's it for today. Thank you so much to Professor Richard Tedeschi for joining us. And if you have guest recommendations for the show, share them with us at info at incisionmedia.com. If you love our show, make sure to like us and please subscribe to get more content like this. And if you like me better in your headphones and maybe not in your face, America Dissected is also a podcast. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to follow me at Abdul Al Sayed, no dash, on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And to check out more of my content and subscribe to our newsletter, head on over to incisionmedia.co. Links to our sponsors are available in the show notes. I do hope that you'll check them out and show them some love. They make the show possible every week.